Another of three serving on Nigeria's electoral process for over four years, the resident electoral commissioner for Benue State, Lentawe Yelwatda, has resigned from the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, and immediately joined partisan politics. Now, Yitwada was appointed REC in July of 2017 and posted to Benue State. He has participated in the conduct of the elections in Benue, Anambra, Oshun, Rivers and Cross River States. Now, when contacted on Wednesday, the former REC confirmed that he stepped down from INEC for personal reasons and that he had joined partisan politics. Well, joining us to discuss this and why all of a sudden we're having this conversation is Jide Ologun. He's a legal practitioner. Thank you very much, Mr. Ologun, for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, the question in everybody's mind is why is it such a crime for um, an INEC official or a public servant of his standing uh, to Chris, uh, cross over to... Um, you know, the political side and want to, you know, be part of the rumble. Even though he was once a referee, now he wants to be a player. Actually, there is no crime in that if you want to go by the provisions of the law. In fact, I believe he has done honorably well by resigning before joining active politics. It should have been more <clears throat> of a concern if he decided to join as an active staff of INEC. And if you look at the law setting up INEC, the Independent National Electoral Commission, Decree 17, now an act of the National Assembly, 1998. You know, it's, it's, it's envisaged a situation like this and had a provision in Section 17 of that decree stating that notwithstanding anything to the contrary in any law, the person who holds or has held office as a member of the commission under the decree after a, a, after a period of five years, after even leaving, will not be qualified to hold any elective office. Uh, you know. And this provision has been expunged from the, the, the law I made reference to. Mm. And if we have no law now prohibiting a staff that leaves INEC to join active politics, then we need to push the ball to the National Assembly. If the fact that he has now worked with the same uh, commission that we handle elections and is likely to understand the game so well to have advantage over other candidates, then the National Assembly should find a way of reinstating that provisions in our laws or Another one that we prevent this occurrence, and he's not the first person that has taken this step. Uh, I recall that in Cross River State, uh, Franklin Bria, uh, the resident electoral commissioner in Cross River, in August 2019 also resigned in a bid to join the governorship race in, in Bayesa State. So the lawmakers are expected, because if you look at Section 4, uh, of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 as amended, it stipulates that the National Assembly shall make laws for the peace, order, and good government of Nigeria. So when issues like this come up, if it's such a uh, paramount concern, then we need to come up with laws that mm. regulate it all. So, uh, as we speak now, no law prohibits him <clears throat> okay. from joining active politics. Well, a lot of people frown at it, and, and one of the reasons why we we hear the National Assembly even came up with that, um, you know, act to try to put a, a stop or put a gap between the time when an INEC official steps out of office or resigns and the time he, uh, you know, starts running for an office was because they felt that it was some somewhat not necessarily moral. And I ask myself, is it an issue of morality? As long as we have the law that we're looking at and these people, I mean, of course, the people that we have as our politicians have the right to one day wake up and say, well, I want to run for office. Even the average Nigerian who's in the private sector can wake up and say, well, I want to resign from my job and run for office because my people need me. But what exactly is wrong with the INEC official who obviously knows uh, the modus operandi of getting elections done 
and of course, maybe having free and credible elections running for an office, is that not trying to make a change? So should we be talking about the morality of this at all in the first instance? Interestingly, you may say it is a morally wrong step to take, but we are not talking about morals here. We are talking about legal issues. So by virtue of the law, he has not contravened any law. And like I mentioned earlier, if it's that important to the government, we have three arms of government. We have the legislative arm that can come up with laws to regulate this uh, type of practice. But as we speak now, it's just like if somebody leaves an NPC or somebody leaves immigration and decides to join active politics, I mean, I've said it that he has even done honorably by resigning. Recall at a time that the president was, you know, uh, so if, you know, let, let's just let's 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 face it as it is right now that um, uh, the National Assembly should take a deep look into this development. Like I said, this is not the first time. This is becoming uh, prominent because right now we are in the season of declaration for, you know, running the race. Mm. And he has resigned. And his, his experiences in INEC does not guarantee him victory at the polls. He still has to go and confront the stakeholders within the party. He has expressed intention to join the All Progressive Congress, APC, and then... Um, you know, there are people who have been laboring and sacrificing in APC, and um, he may have to really network to find his way. He has to pass through the primaries to even emerge mm. as the, the candidate for the governorship race. So there are still a lot of hurdles ahead of him. And if he has chosen to go into active politics, I think his experience in NINEC should, uh, should aid him. But I don't see how that is going to give him any undue advantage in the sense that the party structure will still have to determine who uh, will be fielded for the vacant offices that he wants to buy for, and this time around, the governorship of uh, the two states. Do you think that maybe, I'm just wondering, that the uproar maybe might not necessarily be about the fact that he resigned and, and then immediately declared his intention, but where his intention is is or where he's gone to, the political party that he's gone to. Could that be also the reason why people are frowning at this? Maybe if he joined a, a, just another party, probably wouldn't have been a problem. I'm just curious. Uh, he, could have joined, he could have joined any party, and no law says he cannot be investigated. So if he is investigated and found to have awarded unnecessary favor, to APC as a party he looked forward to cutting in the future. Then we may spring up case in that respect. But right now, there are no allegations. I mean, he's been the, you know, except we want, some people now want to claim that he rigged the election that produced the present governor in Plateau State. If that is not the case, I mean, he's free under the Constitution if he meets the requirements to contest for, for, for office. And like I said, his experience as a resident electoral commissioner, we only support his <clears throat> maneuvers within the party, you know, to he will be able to navigate effectively. And he should also be closely monitored that if he clinches the ticket to fly, he doesn't get undue uh, favor from the same body that will regulate the elections. But by and large, the global picture here is that the National Assembly should be on ground to monitor loopholes like this because laws are made for the people. And as events unfold, we try to manage our laws to suit the purpose. I mm. mean, we still have the case of the uh, the, the victory of Governor Wiki in River State that discovered that even the federal government collecting value-added tax from states it's not constitutional, and the matter is in the Supreme Court, but the stakeholders are seeking political solution rather than legal solution. So laws should be made to cover these loopholes. Like I mentioned earlier, there was a law to that effect that was expunged. You know, the Section 17 of the INEC uh, decree of 1998, now an act of the National Assembly. So... If it was expunged, it's either you introduce it or you don't.
And then um, you just feel comfortable with the decision he has taken. Mm. But like I said, if there are infractions he has committed in office, then uh, the laws of the land can go after him. Uh, just like we are debating this issue of uh, the Electoral Act Amendment Bill that is hanging now, the issue of primary or direct primaries and indirect primaries. You know, somebody may come up later and begin to cry foul that, you know, but as it stands now, it's either parties decide to adopt direct primaries or indirect primaries, and some can even go for consensus candidates. So if he is influential enough to clinch the ticket, he will proceed to contest. I'm just There's curious. No I'm curious as to why, like you said, if, if, a, if a particular act or an amendment is important to us, we should continue to put pressure on the National Assembly to push for laws that we think one way or the other will plug loopholes that would continuously creep up in, the, in, in our Constitution. And you made mention of the Electoral Act, which is still hanging. And, and, and for this particular, um, you know, um, Act um, for the electoral, electoral Act that was, uh, I think it was um, the Principal Act, that's what it was called. After a while, it looks like the people who were pushing for it just let it go, and, it, and that was the end of it. But then now people are crying wolf about this particular situation. So where, why, where is that, you know, continuous pressure, the tenacity that we need to make sure that our lawmakers do the beating of the people as opposed to what they want to do, which will be in their own interest? You know, I, I really don't know the level of pressure we need to mount on them. They made promises before going in there. The Constitution already gives them a mandate in Section 4 to make laws for the peace, order, and good government of Nigeria. I mean, talking about the Electoral Act Amendment Bill that is hanging, a lot of us engage the media space, <laughs> analyzing the pros and cons, and prompting the fact that direct primaries may make the engagement reflect more the democratic tenets expected, which is participatory. But then, for some interest within the power block, you may not fly. And I recall mentioning that even when the president vetoes the bill from the National Assembly, he's just an individual. We have one and nine senators, still around 60 House of Rest members from the National Assembly. The National Assembly also has power under the Constitution of Nigeria to veto the president. So are we now going to beat them up to do the needful? At a point, we, were, we read that the House of Senate was able to put together about 73 signatures, more than the two-third required. In to 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 veto the president, but but the, but the Senate has not also come out. The Senate people. hasn't come out to actually say that that is a truth because you know they they've been tight-lipped about everything for so long. So we really can't yeah. even verify if it's a rumor, if it's actually a fact. I mean, every single person is tight-lipped. But on, on the issue of you saying that we really don't have to, but but then. There are many people who are on that, you know, the floor of the National Assembly, whether it be the upper or the lower house, that need an extra nod because uh, with due respect to most of them, they do not really know why they're there. Uh, you, you know, that is what we see. When you have a purpose, if you don't fully appreciate that purpose, then abuse is inevitable. So are they there for the people? If they are there for the people, it should be easy for them to make laws that will sanitize the environment. But if you benchmark what we have in the country now with the mandates they are expected to exercise, you look at insecurity. I mean, is, is the insecurity in Nigeria so bad that the National Assembly could have shut down the National Assembly and compelled the executive arm to give us security in this land? That's a big question Gideo Logan is asking. Mm. Is the poverty in the land, the inflation in the land, the unemployment rate in the land, are they grievous enough for the National Assembly to rise up because the role of the National Assembly is to facilitate the execution of laws that will sanitize the country and give us prosperity. Section 14, subsection 2 of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 as amended says that the security and the welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. That is a law from the National Assembly. Okay. Is the executive and executing it. And there are provisions for impeachment within the same constitution. So if it's so important to them, they will rise up to get things done. What pressure do you mind mount on them? One of the aspirations of the NSAS protesters was to ensure that 
we sanitize the brutality we have within that sector of our national life. And you saw what happened. That's so, a com that's a conversation for another day. You know what, Barca Logan, we will know, bring you I back. Know, we will know, bring we will so come back and talk about this issue of the National Assembly very soon. But unfortunately, our time is up. And I want to thank you for being here. Um, Barista Julio Logun uh, is, has been speaking with us on this issue. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. God bless Nigeria. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for staying with us. Before we leave you with the comments of Nigerians on the lift of Twitter's suspension by the federal government, I have just a few words for you. It's not enough for us to go on social media and hide behind our avatars and talk smack about the government or criticize and cry foul. Do you have a PVC? Do you know what your ward is? Have you ever registered at a polling unit? There's still time so that you will not go back on social media in a few years' time and cry wolf. I'm Mary Anacone. Have a good evening. I think it's a nice decision. Though the decision in the first day was a bad one, because it will affect our Nigeria uh, freedom of uh, communication and two is going to affect revenue generation for the youth because we are in a social media age where everybody do most of their business online so by so doing the government that said they are creating employment for people creating uh, putting a ban on Twitter we create unemployment so it's a nice decision for lifting the ban one and two, I would say it's also a poor decision from the government in the first place. That is what I can say. Is that because of election, election is coming, and you know in 2015, um, Twitter played a very important role in putting this government into, into power. And now election is around the corner. They are trying to use the same medium they used in 2015 to also Win the, maybe win the election or capture the youth. They know most youth are on Twitter. And they want to also use that to say, OK, uh, uh, we lift the ban because of uh, Twitter has met their target. But the reason why they are lifting this thing is because of the election that is coming next year. Definitely, there must be a fire that ignites a smoke somewhere for the government to call for the band of the Twitter. But I'm suspecting something from the government. It's good that they lifted it. It's good for Nigerians. And as they lifted it, I'm happy about it. 